Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on suicide prevention and postvention, an inter interdisciplinary approach. Uh, and this is a collaboration between the General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaboration and the Mental Health Professionals Network. Um, welcome to the over 1,000 participants that we have already this evening and the viewers who are watching later by a podcast. Uh, and there are over 4,000 people have registrar, uh, registered for this series, which is really exciting. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which our webinar presenters and participants are based and to pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm um, Dr. Mary Emelias and I'm your facilitator this evening. There is a, a slightly new platform. I've been doing these webinars for about 10 years, so I'm bit, probably a little bit more glitchy tonight than usual while I get used to the new one. Um, it's great to have you all with us. Um, my background is general practice and psychotherapy and then um, now I'm halfway through psychiatry training. So I've got a, a foot in a few camps and I really enjoy the inter, interdisciplinary work with MHPN. Just to let you know about the General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaboration, GPMHSC, many of you won't have heard of this organisation, but it's the body responsible for setting the standards and accrediting training in mental health for GPs. And it's made up of a committee which includes representatives from general practice, psychiatry, psychology and the community. Our GPMHSC commissioned the MHN to plan, produce and develop this webinar exploring interdisciplinary mental health care in the field of suicide pre and postvention. There are some fantastic resources from GPMHSC which are available in the resource tab. I'll show you um, about that in a moment. So uh, yeah, just if you're interested in GPMHSC finding out more, there's the website for them. And uh, I'd like to introduce tonight's panel to you. So you did receive everybody's um, bio in the materials before the workshop. So we won't go into great detail, but it's a really um, experienced and um, very, very well-informed panel tonight. It's gonna be a great discussion. So I think um, I'll just first of all welcome Chris Ryan, who's the psychiatrist on our panel tonight. And Chris, I've certainly um, uh, really found some of your articles valuable. There's a couple in the resource box. And I wonder if you just um, give us a couple of words about where you're based and what your role is most days. Uh, sure. So I'm a psychiatrist at Westmead Hospital in Sydney here. That's a very large uh, tertiary referral hospital. I'm the sort of psych I'm a consultation liaison psychiatrist, which means I'm a psychiatrist. I only see people that have a medical problem of some sort, so I spend all my time in the general wards or in the emergency department. And obviously, in that sort of environment, particularly the emergency department, there's a lot of people that write, raise concerns about suicide. Thank you and welcome. Um, and I'd like to invite Dr Louise Stone. Now Louise, you've made a very heroic effort to be with us this evening having got stuck between um, Cairns and Canberra here in a hotel in Brisbane rather than miss the webinar. Um, and you're um, particularly connected with rural general practice. Um, would you like to just let us know a couple of words about what you do on most days? Sure. So, hi everyone. My name's Louise. I'm a GP in Canberra. Um, I have experience in rural, remote and also urban practice. I work in general practice, so I see lots of uh, people with all sorts of issues, and I guess I've got a particular interest in patients with um, somatisation and mixed emotional and physical symptoms, and also, um, I guess, the general things that we do. And I also help to run the Masters in Psychiatric Medicine for New South Wales Health. Welcome, it's great to have you. And Rebecca, you're a clinical psychologist, and um, based in Melbourne, I understand. And you've got a really interesting role with the APS. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. So yes, I work at the APS and have for many years overseen as part of my role, the professional advisory service. So a service that provides uh, advice to psychologists around ethical and professional issues that they come across. And it's in that context, I'm going to talk about the questions that come to us around um, you know, 
working with clients who present with high distress and potentially with you know, a risk of suicide. And it's great to have your expertise, Rebecca, and I'm sure that those issues are um, applicable to all of the professions represented in the, in the participants tonight. And I think we're up to 1,123 um, all over Australia and possibly international. I don't know. Welcome wherever you are. And um, just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what you're looking at on your screen and how to uh, navigate, um, to access the chat box for the uh, participants, you can talk to each other on the purple chat icon. When you're looking for a copy of the slides and the resources that we refer to, they are available from the light blue arrow. If something happens to your screen and you need to refresh, there's a green plus icon and there's an exit button which is the red cross. There is a help button if you need assistance and you can message Redback directly, that's the um, company who are providing the platform for us and you can ring that number 1800 733 416 if you have any problems. I'm just going to um, move across here and show you a little bit about the chat box. So um, this the, the purpose of the webinar is to give us as professionals the skills we need so that we can help people more effectively in the future. Um, many of the topics that we cover, including this one, may affect us personally, and they're very important stories. Um, we do often include consumers and carers on our panel, but we need to make sure that we don't um, put those into the chat box because the story itself that we've been provided to discuss is already um, potentially um, triggering enough for some people and so we, we really want to make sure that we, we don't um, burden each other with, with other stories. But we do strongly encourage you to seek the support of colleagues if you need it. Um, when you registered, you did automatically agree to the ground rules and if you're unsure of them, they are in the supporting um, resources tab in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and again, Aidan's story, we're going to be talking about Aidan tonight, is in the resources tab. The way it's going to work is that each panellist will give um, a response to the story, followed by questions and answers that will be between the panel and the panel and the audience. We have um, welcome to the questions that you submitted prior to the webinar and we'll be including those as much as we can. Please bear in mind the time goes really quickly and if you do post a question that doesn't get answered, um, please um, accept apologies in advance because it's never possible to cover everything, but we'll do our best. Now, just to remind you of the learning outcomes, at the completion of the webinar, hopefully we'll be better able to recognise and respond to mental health issues which may indicate risk factors for suicide. Um, to be able to support bereaved patients, communities and ourselves when responding to a death by suicide. And to be able to implement tips and strategies to enhance communication and build capacity between practitioners when we're treating people who may be at risk of suicide or responding to a death by suicide. So we will have um, our three presenters in a, in a particular order. So Chris is going to speak to us first about prevention, Louise about postvention, and Rebecca about communication between practitioners. There will be a lot of overlap and interweave and um, once we get to the Q&A, um, we'll all be you know, contributing to that. So I'd first of all like to welcome Chris. Um, just to remind you a tiny bit about Aidan, the GP in a country town has um, seen Aidan and all of his family members, knows them all, and Aidan's a young man who's 20. Um, and you've read the story, so I think I'll just hand straight over to Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks very much, Mary. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm going to be talking, as Mary said, about the prevention side of the story. Uh, just to recap quickly, perhaps to pull out the most important elements, we know that Aidan is a mechanics apprentice, he's popular, he's affable and he's relaxed. And we also know that you have a good relationship with him. Back when he was 17, he had an episode of what was diagnosed, quite reasonably it seems, as an amphetamine-induced psychosis. We know that he's a sensible fellow because after that he immediately gave up speed and cannabis 
And in fact, he's uncommonly sensible for a 20-year-old apprentice because not only did he tell you about a conflict that he was having with his father, but when uh, you suggested he see a psychologist, he did, and apparently he benefited. Now he's back seeing you because he wants a work certificate. He's pretty upset because he's just broken up with his girlfriend and he is worrying that he's had thoughts of his own death, but it seems that you followed up on that and he's reassured you that he has no plans to suicide and actually he would never consider killing himself. It's not really clear what other history you took at the time, but he agrees to see a psych go back to see the psychologist and to see you again in four weeks. Four weeks later, he's done neither. Uh, you contact him, but he says he's fine. So here's my first impression of this case. It sounds like you did everything pretty much right. And that's important because it's natural to ask yourself in these situations if you could have or should have done more, but I'm not seeing it. We really weren't told that much uh, about how much detail you went into when he mentioned thoughts of his own death. And ideally, I would have liked to get a little bit more information than we were presented with. But... You probably didn't have that much time. He came in for a work certificate, after all, and it probably took a while for him to get to the whole I've had thoughts of death thing. Uh, so I'm guessing you were pretty pressed by that point. He also, we're, we're also told that he was looking dreadful, tired and angry. And that could be concerning, depending on the context, because it might indicate some sort of decline in functioning. So um, what else could you have asked him if you'd had time, either in that appointment or possibly at the next appointment, which, depending on how concerned you were, could have been perhaps a little sooner than four weeks, perhaps next week or in a fortnight? Well, basically, the answer to that question is more detail. The idea with taking these sorts of histories is to, as much as possible, find out what it's like to be Aiden. What happened in the breakup, for example? Aiden said that she slept with one of his friends. I mean, what happened there? How does he feel about it now? He said that he had thoughts of his own death, but he wouldn't kill himself. So what thoughts of his own death was he having at the time? Is he still thinking about that? And also, when do those thoughts come up? You could also ask about features of major depression or perhaps a relapse of his amphetamine use or alcohol use, because I guess any of those are pop, uh, possible. Notice, by the way, that I'm not asking any questions that might be classically considered as looking for risk factors for suicide. And this is because, and I suspect this is going to be the big take-home from me tonight, it is not possible to usefully categorise patients who present in psychiatric crisis into those that are at higher or lower risk of suicide or serious self-harm. You can't do risk assessment, so you can forget about it. I'll leave it there for the time being. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. That's a, a very um, uh, attention-getting point to leave it on, and I know that we'll be coming back to that in the, um, in the panel discussion, because people are certainly required to do risk assessments in their work, and related to the Mental Health Act and all kind of things. So if we don't do that, then what do we do? Um, but I also appreciated your um, you know, comment that really the GP actually did a pretty good job. And I know when these things happen, we always look back at what else we could have done. So it's really helpful to think, well, what, what could we do more? Uh, and now 
Louise, you're going to talk about from the GP perspective because I know when I read this case, I certainly my mind was taken back to the you know the dreadful experience as a GP of having lost a patient to suicide, and particularly when you have the, the family as your patients as well and a whole community that's affected and people looking to you for help. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Louise. Thanks. Well, I'm most relieved to hear that question um, coming from Chris because it, it makes me feel so much better. And one of the biggest questions that we always have as GPs is what could we have done differently? I think it's hard as a GP to understand just the... De the degree of pressure that you're under in an average day when you're seeing so many people in so many settings and patients may or may not give you permission to actually explore where they're coming from. It's quite different when a patient turns up to accident and emergency or they turn up to a psychiatrist or they turn up to a psychologist, they're definitely help seeking. They might be coming to us in this case for a piece of paper for their work or for a script and there's only so far that you feel you can press um, the questioning and particularly when it's squeezed in on a Friday afternoon. So as a GP, as Mary said, those moments that you remember always are the patients that you lose. And it is always, there's always this sense you have of what could have been prevented and what you should have done and it's difficult. And we carry those around with us for a very long time. I think as family doctors, though, we also have other responsibilities. And when we're looking at a small country town, we always have responsibilities not only to the family but also to the community. And remember that when you're a country doctor, your kids may be in Aidan's year. Um, they may be in the same year as the brothers of Aidan. The brothers might have been in your lounge room. It makes it incredibly difficult to manage your own grief and also to deal with the responsibilities that you share for community. Weirdly enough, when um, crises like these happen, people often turn to country doctors and we end up doing community-based things. We go into high schools, we, we talk to the teachers, we debrief um, various people, including first responders. We can tend to get together with them as well. So a lot of responsibility. And on top of that, as family doctors, we also have that nasty jangle in the back of the mind that um, this is going to be a coroner's case. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the questions that might arise, including do you go and visit the family? Um, do you attend the funeral? Those sort of questions are actually quite tricky uh, to negotiate. And there are no straight answers. It's something we all have to work out in our own way. I did want to say, as country doctors, we do seem to have a few responsibilities. And one of them, I think, is that people aren't necessarily aware of healthy grieving. It's something that used to be well known in the community, but is not so well known now. So it's not uncommon for us to spend up to a year of the relatives of someone who has died by suicide coming into us and, and talking about what's normal and needing advice about uh, when they should go back to work, how much they should be working, whether it's normal to not be sleeping and those sorts of questions. Obviously, we need to um, spend some time with the parents and deciding also between the parents what's going on because often the parents will have very different opinions about, for instance, how to run a funeral. And it's not, it isn't uncommon for people to come in and help, um, need help to actually work through that. It's important to think about whether there is ways in the family and also in the community to reduce the risk of suicide imitation, particularly amongst adolescents. This would be a small community, and so Aidan's death would resonate throughout the whole community. And you, you feel like for some time that you have this ear up looking out for any risk factors in other people. It, it means that you're always practising with that slight edge of, you know, what, what resonance has there been amongst the community with Aidan's death. And finally, there's that question of us. And without turning it all towards the practitioner, the rate of suicide amongst doctors is quite high. In fact, it's 4%, which is very high, the rate of um, suicide attempts amongst doctors. We are perfectionistic types, and that means that um, we question ourselves, and it, it can be very easy to take on that responsibility. We worry that people will blame us for missing something. We worry that uh, the community will no longer trust us. And in fact, it's often a time that GPs will choose to drop out of the profession altogether. So it's a time when GPs need um, particular support. And in a small town, that can be 
difficult because most of the community are their patients. So it's something that I always encourage GPs to do, to find support networks. There are plenty of them and there's plenty in the resources that we've provided to reach out beyond the small community as well as within the small community to get the support that you need. Thanks so much, Louise, and we'll um, look forward to, to talking further together shortly. Um, and so I guess what Louise was finishing off there really leads well into, Rebecca, your role around um, supporting practitioners with the ethical and professional challenges um, that they come across in their work, particularly psychologists. However, it's relevant for all of us. So I'd, I'd like to welcome you now, Rebecca. Thanks, Mary. Um, and yes, look, I totally agree. I'm just going to just flick one slide too much. So I totally agree that all of the areas that I'm going to cover at the moment are areas that psychologists ask about, but I think all professionals working in the mental health space uh, and particularly facing uh, the issues of working with someone who might be communicating suicidal thoughts or be highly distressed where there's concern about risk would be um, raising some of these, potentially some of these questions. And the first one um, that we get is around competence. Because working with someone who presents uh, highly distressed, potentially at risk, can be really stressful for the professional and especially uh, we find in private practice where you might be working in a context where you don't really see this presentation all the time and so you're questioning uh, whether, I guess, whether you're up to it. Um, now, mostly what we find when we start to speak to people, and if you think about um, Chris's uh, outline around what needs to be done, mostly mental health professionals do have the skills to be able to at least do that initial assessment and take some action based on that, like whether that be to refer on or whether that be to work with the person yourself um, around these issues, whether you have to actually at take action to protect that person. But in the end, you know, for, if you're going to work in the mental health space, there is an obligation to, to take some action, to make a, form a clinical judgment about what you're going to do to protect this person. So that really leads then to confidentiality, because if you decide to make a disclosure, then that's another challenge that we find uh, psychologists bring to us. Um, there are limits to confidentiality, and one of those is where, your, um, need, where you need to protect your client. So making that decision isn't always easy, and what we usually recommend is that you have a chat to your client if you feel that there's a need to disclose to protect them. Bring that client along with you. In some cases, you could talk to them about who you might make that disclosure to. Often it might be a family member or someone else who can who can come in and work with that person to keep them safe until you can link them into a service. Now, in the case of Aidan, that um, didn't need to happen because the GP had done the assessment. He had come to the clinical judgment that a referral to a psychologist was appropriate. In the end, he ha all he has to go by is what the client is bringing to him at that time. So that's all you've got to go by. Um, so, you know, you need to be able to form a judgment to take some sort of action at the end of that assessment. So what about confidentiality after a suicide, uh, which is a question that, that's really quite interesting because actually confidentiality does actually remain even after someone's death. And certainly in Victoria, New South Wales and Tasmania, there is legislation that actually legislates that confidentiality around health um, information remains for 30 years after someone's death. Um, that's, that's not in the other states, but we generally use that as a bit of guide. So that is challenging then when you potentially, after the death, might have family members approaching you uh, for information. So that takes us to communication and what, how communication should work between health professionals, but also between others when um, someone's at risk of suicide and also after suicide. And one of the um, recommendations we make is that practices have clear protocols around 
how they um, undertake their work, including in communication. So having a documented protocol that actually outlines under certain conditions how that communication will work. And it, it would cover things like what information is to be shared, when and with who, what sort of follow-up. Now, it's not clear what information uh, went from the GP to the psychologist, whether you know, the, the thoughts of suicide was communicated, would the communication have been different? Um, possibly would it have made a difference? Maybe not. But I think engaging um, with other professionals more uh, is something that we should do. And especially if there are risk issues, then there might be different ways of, of approaching that depending on, on, on your assessment. Again, in this situation, um, uh, Aidan was clear that there wasn't any risk and he also accepted the referral to the psychologist. There was absolutely no indication that that was not going to happen. So what about speaking to family members? So that's really important. Obviously, if family members contact you, you need to treat them with compassion. It's really important to talk to them and potentially even to meet with them. But also, you've got to balance that with your obligations around confidentiality. And I always say it's a little bit like providing psychological first aid. You know, you can provide them with information and support, make sure they, they are linked in to services if they need to. But also in this particular case, because the family was really well known to the GP, the GP would probably want to be monitoring those family members as well. And of course, um, keeping really good records is important. Um, you know, there may be a coroner's investigation, so you know, even though you don't want to think about the worst case scenario, your documentation is your best defence. So. Um, lawyers always have this golden rule around the more that a presentation departs from your typical presentation, the more you need to document. And I actually think that's a really good um, rule to have for uh, mental health professionals as well and, and in a case like this because that, that documentation is really what you have that to support the basis for your decision making. And finally, uh, reflective learning, like it's really important to have that process of debriefing and, you know, with, with a, a senior colleague or, or someone who, who, you know, can can speak to. And over time, it, you know, it, it's important to also reflect on, you know, on the incident, I guess, on how you, you dealt with it, with the feelings afterwards. Uh, I think it's really important for your self-care to go through that learning that sort of reflecting learning process. Um, I think hindsight sometimes can be a bit like a slap in the face. Don't slap yourself in the face. It's not what it's about. But with any service that we provide, it's important to then go back. You know, if you didn't get the outcome that you were expecting, you know, could something have been done differently? Um, and, you know, would that have made a difference? Perhaps not. But I think we can always... It's always important to evaluate what you've done, look at what could be changed, um, and that's part of learning from this as well. And that's it for me. Thanks, Rebecca. I really valued what you were talking there about, um, about for the family, compassion versus confidentiality, and um, it's a really, it can be very complicated, and I know that that's being reflected in the, um, the chat box as well. So what I'm going to do is, because so, so Chris dropped us a bombshell in his last slide, which um, people are really concerned now about, well, what, what am I supposed to do? So I think we felt that there were a few themes that would come out of this, and we have a little poll to help you um, guide the direction of the webinar, but I'm going to go straight back to risk assessments. And Chris, I'd like to bring you in, you know, with, with that um, comment that you made. So if... If we can't do risk assessment, we've always been taught that we have a duty of care to do risk assessment and then do something called safety planning. And I wonder um, if you could comment on that, given the research. Sure. So, um, so again, just to be clear exactly what I mean when I'm talking about risk assessment, I'm talking about 
Uh, and people did think that this was possible for a while. The idea that people that present to a GP's office or to the emergency department or anywhere, any other clinical situation, that perhaps it would be possible to extract uh, clinical features or demographics and using those, you could work out is, is this person at higher risk of suicide than other people? Um, and, and if you could do that, I guess that would be great because then we would know to focus our resources on those people. Uh, it just turns out that you can't. Um, people have looked for this uh, over and over again, but as soon as somebody presents in some sort of psychiatric crisis, so basically as soon as you think to yourself, oh, this could be, uh, you know, this person might raise concerns about suicide, then they fall into a class of people who are at definitely at increased risk of suicide, but they're all at increased risk of suicide and there are no clinical or demographic features that usefully uh, make any one, any, that you can usefully divide people into those at higher or lower risk in that already high risk group. So that's what I mean by risk assessment, this idea that perhaps you could pick the losers, as it were, uh, the people that were more likely to suicide of the people you're concerned with, you can't. So since you can't, um, you don't have to. Uh, you really can't be expected to do something that you can't do. Um, all you need to do, uh, and there's no nothing small about this, uh, is do the sorts of things that I was suggesting. So you just need to, as much as possible, uh, understand this person's predicament. Where, where are they coming from? Um, do, are there features of some psychiatric illness that, might, that they might benefit from treatment of that? And then with that person and with their family, try and work out the best uh, way forward. Um, it's just standard medicine, really. So, you know... Actually, most doctors are pretty good at that. They don't have to be worried about risk scales or writing down high or low risk or anything like that. They just have to try and understand the patient and then work out with them the best way of going. Thanks, Chris. And I'm sure we're going to keep coming back to this. But I, um, I'm sure that the experience is being understood and heard around those things that are really painful is, is in itself really valuable um, and, and is therapeutic. So having, having the doctor ask more details or whichever practitioner it would be and actually being able to talk about those painful things is very helpful. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is we will move to our poll. So what will happen is that um, there, are, there are four themes that have come up on your screen now, which um, we felt you uh, participants, the audience might be interested in discussing further. We've touched on risk assessment already. So we're gonna have about 30 seconds. Um, I've read, Redback will bring up the poll for us. Um, and a pop-up will appear on your screen and you just choose one that you would most like us to discuss. There'll be, you know, 20 to 30 seconds for you to um, to answer the questions and then um, you'll be able to see the results at the end. So we'll just give it a few, um, a few more seconds. I understand that the poll is up and you can see it. I can't, so I'm just um, trusting the universe that it's all working well. Um, look, I think any of the topics that, um, that are on the screen have really come up already in the chat box tonight too. And, um, on the basis of previous webinars, I'm sure you're helping each other with, with these issues as well. I guess this case is particularly set in a rural um, community where the GP is even more likely to have multiple relationships. Not only the GP, the psychologist probably has, you know, kids that go to school or coaches the netball team as well as seeing um, some of the clients. So I think we're just about to the end of the poll. So I think you've had long enough and um, Redback, if you could close the poll and show us the results. 
Now, if it transpires that I can't see the results, then I'll just need um, MHPN to write those in the chat box for me. So I can't see them, but um, I'm just waiting to hear what the outcome was, and then we'll, we'll keep going. So uh, we're just waiting for the, the big calculator, the big room full of computers like the ones that sent the space shuttle into space. No, I think we might just keep going. So I think I'm going to, um, first of all, I think we'll go to Rebecca. People in the audience have been asking about safety plans. Now Chris spoke to us just before about um, working with Aidan and his family about what would be most helpful um, and you you commented Rebecca about the idea of a safety plan and, and it wasn't clear whether there was one so I'm wondering what what you think about safety plans and the idea of of practitioners actually sort of documenting a formal safety plan in the notes Rebecca thanks yeah I mean I, I think it is um, what's promoted now as best practice is to develop a safety plan and to work with your client or your patient to do that. So it's really got to work for them. So it's it's tailored specifically for their presentation. Um, so it's really going to cover really practical step-by-step -step, um, information for that person to keep them safe. I mean that's that's essentially the aim of it. Um, so it would it would include things that would for them identify when things were really getting tough, um, would be to give them prompts around what's important, reasons for living, um, people that they can speak to in, in you know, their, their family or their close community that will support them at that time, uh, particular coping strategies that they can use. And, and when when they might get to a point where they really need to then make contact with the health professional. So it's really about kind of like a, a, a sort of step-by-step -step process to keep them safe. And I think that that is generally an expectation that if there's someone who's at risk that you put in some sort of safety plan like that. Thanks, Rebecca. I guess um, one thing I've done is, is think of it more as a coping plan so when you're feeling really distressed, what are the things that you do that help you cope with that? And that might include the phone numbers that you're going to call or the people you're going to contact. I just don't use the word safety plan, but I think it's probably got the same content. But I was really thinking, Louise, it's, as a GP, it's an interesting situation because you might be seeing Aidan for this consult when you've got, you know, an extra squeeze in appointment in that hour and he only had a 15 minute appointment and it's always complex. So I was just wondering, as a GP, where does safety planning fit in if it does? I think it no. does. I think um, in our mental health treatment plans, it's the bit that we do try to write in for the patient to keep. I have a great belief in the bits that are ripped off the bottom of the prescription pads and are stuck on the fridge. I believe in things that are stuck on the fridge. I believe in things that um, I scribble notes and I'm always astonished that patients keep them. I, I, I do think there's something about giving a patient something to take home that they can hang on to. Even that reminder of the relationship with a clinician I think is important, that it's something that you've worked on together, that you've come to some conclusions about. I just wanted to comment on the rural and remote question because that's something different Rural and remote, I think, is a different question because you have a combination of impulsivity and means. So Aidan has access to means on in a farm. There's poisons, there's, there's um, you know, various implements that he can use. There's always guns, there's always equipment, and there's isolation. If you add to that the fact that in a rural community there's usually also a heck of a lot of alcohol and, you know, a fair free range of, of drugs, you've actually got access to means. And in terms of safety planning, certainly in rural that's something that I used to think about a lot 
because to me, going back to what Chris said with the with the um, question of risk assessment, for me, a lot of what um, I had conversations about was impulsivity and how to manage that because working in rural accident and emergency in my little town, one of the things that we would certainly notice was this, um, this acting out and not having any breaks on that acting out. And so a young man like Aidan going from distress to suicidality very fast and then having easy access to means. So I think that's something that I think of a lot more um, now than I guess I used to before I was exposed to rural practice. Thanks, Louise. Now, I have got the um, answer to our poll, which was that uh, risk assessment is, is still rated really highly, so I think we do need to keep particularly focusing on this. And um, I suspect, Chris, I'd like to bring you back in, um, the, the idea of the safety plan. And I noticed you, you spoke about how, um, you know, working out with Aidan and his family what is likely to be most helpful. So. Also just that question of confidentiality. So if you are concerned about him and you think his family will be a support, but he doesn't want you to talk to them, I guess it's a two-pronged question, but if you, if you could comment on how to approach talking to the family and um, ha how we go about it if the young, the young man doesn't want us to, and then also how that feeds into the idea of a safety plan. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Um... So look, uh, I mean, here's, as a general rule, if somebody doesn't want you to talk about their medical problems, uh, you shouldn't. But, um, or at least you shouldn't if they're competent to make that decision. And that's sort of relevant because sometimes, for example, people uh, might get so depressed that they don't want you to talk to the family uh, for incompetent reasons, like you can't talk to my family because uh, I deserve to be punished and uh, they'll try and stop me from being punished. So if the person's incompetent, um, they don't really understand why, you know, they, their, their request for confidentiality isn't really born of any competent desire, then I think whole new uh, rules apply. But for most people, um, Generally speaking, if people are competently refusing that, you should respect that. However, almost everybody will, with negotiation, agree that it's okay you can speak to somebody. And that's particularly if you're really concerned and you point out to the person why you're really concerned and why you really, really do want to speak to somebody. It doesn't have to be your dad. Uh, it doesn't have to be a mum if that's going to be, but there must be someone that we can talk to. Almost always you can negotiate that sort of thing. It's pretty unusual for me to be really worried about someone would really like to talk to somebody, but that person is competently refusing. I mean, it does happen, but that would be, that would be quite unusual. And in terms of working out the management uh, plan, um, which I'm, I'm also not mad on the safety plan name myself, but in work, but I'm, but I'm very mad on working with patients and their families to try and work out the best way of doing things going forward. And that would include a lot of things that are typically uh, included in a safety plan. And would it also include writing stuff down? Because I completely agree, writing people don't remember everything you say anyway, and writing things down uh, is a great idea. And part of that will, in most cases, be getting support from the people that are around, and that includes the family. So it's going to be hard to do that if we don't speak to them. Thanks, Chris. Um, Rebecca, I, I'd um, be really interested, this is probably like a, a little bit tangential, but it was an interesting question that came up right at the beginning about um, attendance at the funeral. And, um, you know, the GP's part of the community, the young man might be, you know, friends with his kids. Um, there's so many reasons why you might want or feel it's appropriate to go to that funeral. Um, it would be enormously difficult to do that, but it might be the most right thing to do. And I wonder, is that crossing some kind of professional boundary? Or how do we think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think in this case you're right because it's such a small community and um, the GP clearly and the family were all well known to each other that it might have, you know, just been an expectation. But I think it can, it can be difficult and can be seen as a boundary issue because, of course, you know, um, there's, there's essentially an aspect of disclosure in attending a funeral as well, um, and, you know, if you're not a close friend. But, it, you know, in, in this case as well, I mean, you don't really know how the family's going to respond. You know, sometimes families can be really, can feel really angry at health professionals. You know, they can kind of, there can be a bit of blame initially before, you know, they really understand what's happening. So it did surprise me a little bit in this case um, that the first communication with the family was actually at the funeral. So, um, you know, I do think, you know, if you've been working with, a family, you know the family well, that there might have been some communication before that, um, you know, to call up, you know, offer the, your condolences, see how the family is actually coping. Um, it, yeah, so I think, I think then you can check whether it's appropriate to attend the funeral as well, whether the family feels comfortable with you attending. Thanks, Rebecca. Louise, I'd like to um, invite you back in because I'm just thinking if you were the GP and you did attend um, or even in subsequent conversations, you know, I think that the GP is already asking why, why did this happen, was there anything I missed, could, could anything have changed the situation. But I'm pretty sure that, that, that family and friends that may also ask the practitioner why, mm. why did this happen and, and looking to you for that really unanswerable question. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about, you know, how you handle that and I think we'll probably come back to Chris and Rebecca on this question as well. You know, how do we answer when people say why? Well, I think the first thing you do is that you ask rather than answer. People often have concerns. Um, did I miss something? Should I have been there last week? Did I say the wrong phrase at dinner on Friday and was that the final straw. I think the thing that, that people are often asking about is whether or not they could have some, done something differently. They're often um, going over in their minds, particularly close family, things that have happened and it's all incredibly confusing. They've also had uh, um, thoughtless comments come from the community. It, it astonishes me the sorts of comments that come from family and friends and um, in, in all sorts of circumstances of, of people that will say things to, to people they hardly know that are very thoughtless and very hurtful. So giving people a chance to express those is terribly important so that you get a chance to, um, to correct misapprehensions. That if, if only I'd been there for that five minutes, I could have prevented it, it would never have happened, that sort of question. I think the why question, there are two things that are terribly important to say. The first is that suicide is always the culmination of something very complex. It's never just one thing. It's never just one decision that doesn't come on the, the back of a whole lot of background. And I think it's terribly important for people to understand that there's not one intervention that they could have made that would have changed the course of history. The other thing that I think is terribly important is the role of mental illness. And I don't mean that everyone who suicides has mental illness, but I think it's important for people to understand that there is a, a lack of judgment that has occurred, that in that moment of suicide, a person felt that there was no help available. And that, that in that moment, they didn't feel that they could reach out to the supports that were there. And the reason I say that is that it's very important to get across the message that there are supports, that there are always supports, that there are always capacities um, for people to reach out. Um, but in that moment, um, someone like Aidan was unable to do so because of the mental state that he was in. I think getting that balance right is, is terribly important and hard and takes a lot of um, empathic energy in the room to be with that person and to try and hear what they have to say. Um, but I think they're the two things that are important. That moment of saying it's complex, 
and the second thing saying that there was no point at which there was no help. It's just that in the moment, that person could not see the help that was there. Does that help? Yeah, I, I found that really helpful. Um, I mean, it's so kind of uh, delicate and complex, isn't it? I, I'd like to invite Chris back in just to comment on that. I noticed, Louise, um, you pointed out there that not everyone who... Um, who has suicidal thoughts or behaviours or who does die by suicide, not everybody does have mental illness. Um, and so, Chris, I, I wondered also if you wanted to comment on how, how we might help people with the why question. Why did this happen? Uh, yes. So, well, I mean, not everybody has mental illness. That's certainly the case. I mean, the studies are a little difficult to interpret. But probably the majority of people would have had some sort of diagnosable illness um, or syndrome of some sort. It's not like people just, you know, decide without any other reason, generally speaking, that they're going to kill themselves. Um, I don't know that that's a particularly... I mean, that can sometimes be a useful thing to say uh, to families. Um, but it is incredibly complex, and it's really going to depend on the individual's circumstances. I think it's it's good to try and get out ahead of uh, various things that people are probably already thinking. So it's probably good to get out ahead of the idea. They're almost certainly blaming themselves um, for what's happened, so to sort of suggest that in this sort of circumstance, many people find themselves blaming themselves. Um, or feel that they should have seen something. People can often develop these sort of omen ideas that, are, you know, they should have known that when he walked out of the house, uh, you know, and slammed the door a week ago that they should have intervened. Um, and I think it's probably pretty important to, to the extent that it's possible and where people are up to varies. Um, and it also depends on your relationship with the family. But if you can get out ahead of that stuff and identify that and perhaps um, neutralise that, uh, I think that probably does help at least some people. I mean, people are going to feel terrible, so to be realistic about this, this is an awful, awful thing to happen to families and there's only so much anyone is going to be able to do. But I think there are some things you can do. Another, another thing that is sometimes worth getting out ahead of, but again, you've got to be very cautious about this, is that uh, families can find themselves being very angry with the person that has suicided. So just being aware of that possibility and in some circumstances acknowledging that even that can happen and that that's a pretty normal reaction. Um, can sometimes be useful. So this sort of normalising of these normal reactions, because after all, they, these people haven't been through this before, hopefully. Uh, they don't know how they're supposed to feel, um, and it is probably worthwhile trying to assist them in understanding that, as difficult as it is. I don't think there's anything easy about this. No, thanks, Chris. I, I think we'd all agree with that. I just keep feeling for this poor GP who, who has so many roles and so much, um, so many different functions in this community. Um, Rebecca, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that, that um, same question about, you know, how do we respond to those questions from, from family and friends about why? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, um, Chris and Louise have covered it really well, but I think, you know, in a case like Aidan's, you know, bringing it back to, you know, to the fact that there were many things happening, um, you know, he was struggling with a lot of things that, you know, these were things that, you know, he was, you know, trying to deal with, that he, he, he did have mental health problems, giving him the, that information, um, it, you know, if, if that's something that, that's going to help them, it is really difficult if there's a confidentiality issue. So, you know, what you can talk about um, is general information about mental illness. So, you know, general information about... I mean, they obviously knew that he was seeing the, the GP 
for these problems, if that's the case, then, then you can just talk generally about mental illness rather than specifically around things that Aidan was communicating. I guess I'm coming from the, that really difficult perspective of balancing confidentiality with what you can say. And usually um, it's really about providing information of, of why people do take their own life in the end. You know, that sort of feeling that, that you know, nothing's going to help them and, you know, they're feeling to totally, um, you know, this level of hopelessness. Um, I, I think Louise's point around clarifying, you know, misperceptions that might come from the community is really important because one of the things about a family coming to talk to you is that often they don't have anyone to talk to because people, people in the community, their friends and other family members often don't really know how to, how to have that discussion with them about how they're feeling, um, how they kind of can make sense of it themselves. So it's really about providing them support and information that's going to help them work through it. Thanks, Rebecca. Now, L Louise, I'm going to come back to you as the GP because um, the participants are, you know, have been noticing that there are, um, you know, the other family members that we haven't really specifically addressed yet. On that note, there are 1,600 participants still with us, which is fantastic. It's obviously a um, conversation that we really need to have. So, Louise, um, I suppose the two people that the people have particularly noticed is um, the other son. Tim, the resilient one, and then I think the father is, is on everybody's minds as well. So I just wondered if you'd like to comment on, on the family members, since it might be you that they come to see. Thanks. Yeah, look, this is one where you would have a conversation in the practice and look at who's, who's working with who. Um, it may be that you see mum and your partner sees dad or, or however, but you would mobilise the whole practice because um, it's going to be tricky for any one person to actually see the entire family. I will say, coming back to Rebecca's question about confidentiality, one of the things you learn as a rural doctor really quickly is how to put sort of barriers in your head. So you work out what mum's told you, what dad's told you, what auntie Flo's told you, who knows what. And it, it, it's a skill that I've been grateful for my entire career, but it is very difficult. And that does make it harder. And also the context, do you go to the farm? Do you sit down with mum in the kitchen? and do a home visit and have a conversation there? Or is it better in the practice? Do you see them one-on-one -on -one or do you see them together? And this is where you sit down together. In terms of the sons, um, if they are typical uh, country adolescent boys, it's going to be actually quite difficult to get them to talk at all. And so sometimes you find yourself having conversations with these kids uh, bringing up, you know, when I've talked to other families who've had these circumstances, some people have said that, you know, they have nightmares as that happened to you and, and trying to get these kids to talk. But it has to be uh, when they're ready and that's the hard bit, is trying to find ways to interact with these young men as, as much as you can reasonably without hovering so that when they're ready to talk, they see you as someone who is um, who is someone they can talk with. I just wanted to, to comment briefly on the, the value these days of suicide helplines that have chat rather than phone calls. I find with adolescents, um, and particularly boys, the idea of ringing a helpline is just way beyond anything that they would be prepared to do. But the idea of hanging around on something like the suicide helpline for an anonymous person to type on the screen and they type back and they can call themselves Fred Smith and no one knows who they are is incredibly helpful. And I make sure that I drop that into the equation fairly early. Um, I also find school teachers are particularly helpful in this circumstance and there is no way you would not in this circumstance be having a conversation with those two boys year level coordinators at this point. Thanks, Louise. It's really um, practical help. They're no doubt born out of experience. Um, I, on the topic of helplines, I wonder, Chris, I might bring you in on, on the evidence as to whether they actually work. Do they make a difference? Um, essentially, nobody knows. Um, the evidence base for helplines is poor. Um, it is probably the case that people feel better if... I mean, we know that people tend to feel better if they talk to somebody, 
it would be very surprising if that wasn't the case for people with the ring helplines and stay on the phone. And certainly I've got plenty of patients that uh, part of their management plan is as because they find this useful uh, to ring suicide helplines. Uh, do they actually make it less likely or does the existence of a suicide helpline decrease a community's uh, overall suicide rate? Nobody knows and perhaps that's a little unlikely but perhaps that's not the only thing that we should be worried about. So that's an interesting um, comment there. It's not the only thing we should be worried about. Uh, one of the things that was placed in as a pre-registration question was around um, sort of primary prevention. So, so is there any evidence about things that we can be doing in communities or in primary care before people start to have suicidal thoughts or to be considering suicide as an option? Chris, I might ask you first and then I think I might come to Rebecca on that one. So is there sort of, um, you know, primary prevention, early intervention that, that is has some evidence or is worth doing? What kinds of things make a difference? Uh, well, the, the, the clearest evidence on suicide prevention, just focusing on that, as I say, I do, I do think that there's broader issues at play here. I don't, I'm not sure that we necessarily want to be always, I mean, I know no, it's about suicide, but I don't know that we always want to be just focusing on we've got to get those suicide numbers down. But if we do want to get those suicide numbers down, then removing access to means of suicide uh, has very strong evidence um, that it decreases suicide. So um, uh, guns, having guns not available, uh, that's very good. The, um, when we move from Panadol, which you could just screw out of a, uh, the tin and uh, you had to punch it out, so it took a bit longer, that, that makes a difference. Um, the fact that there's catalytic converters on cars now, so it's harder to um, kill yourself by carbon monoxide, uh, that makes a difference. Um, and putting barriers around places where people typically jump off uh, makes a difference. Interestingly, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that if you put a barrier around where people typically jump off, then people will go to some other place that they could just as easily jump off. Uh, it's, not, it's not like when a barrier goes up on a bridge, people go, well, I can't jump off that bridge anymore, so I'll just go to the top of that tall tower and jump off that. Um, that's just not what people do. So that sort of stuff, uh, very good evidence for. And if you've got uh, a suicide place in your community, and these, these are around, um, then in terms of primary pre prevention, a uh, really important thing to think about is can we put some sort of barrier there so that people can't do that as easily. Again, it's, it's really pragmatic. It almost feels a bit confronting talking about it in such pragmatic terms, but I think that is clearly what the evidence says, so it's really helpful. Um, Rebecca, I, I wanted to bring you back in just around um, what things we can be doing at a community level or a very early intervention level, whether you have any comments on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Chris. The strongest evidence is to re remove the means. And, you know, like he covered that beautifully, but I always um, think about this really interesting study that I read where they, um, they stopped using, a, uh, I think it was in Sri Lanka, and they stopped using a particular uh, quite um, toxic um, pesticide and the suicide rate just went down enormously. So, you know, it really is about, you know, removing the means. That is, is the strongest evidence. But obviously, look, there's, there's a lot of um, education now about, you know, people um, being, you know, increasing awareness of um, suicide, you know, you know, looking after each other and, and just, you know, kind of noticing and asking questions. Um, I don't know, like, really that, that um, has made a, a big difference. Certainly, um, the research I don't think you know is clear on that. Um, so, really, sadly, that just the, removing the the means is what really um, is supported by the literature. Thank you. Correct. It, 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 it yes, is also. Comment. I mean, it is worth saying. And as I say, this is there's not there's not great evidence on this, but. Um, 
a lot of people suicide because they've got a mental illness, it's a good idea to treat mental illness effectively. Uh, I, I think that there, there's a reasonable amount of evidence that actually does decrease the suicide uh, rate in those people. But more importantly, it, it helps their mental illness. So um, identifying associated mental illnesses or substance problems and then addressing them, I mean, I know that sounds absolutely obvious, but, uh, you know, obvious things uh, worth doing. Yeah. And throwing in there, I've, I've got to say, Mary, throwing in there, you know, if they have a roof over their head, food to eat, and, you know, some social determinants of health, it doesn't hurt. A living wage would make a big difference as well. Um, but, again, I, I think those are sort of the primary prevention points of view, I guess, from my perspective as well. Yeah, thanks, Louise. I was actually about to um, in, invite you back in, so I'll get you to stay there. Just for the audience, I'm not sure what... I think Louise's camera's a bit... Um, glitchy, so um, you may just be seeing a still photo of Louise, but she's still with us. Um, Louise, I, we haven't actually talked very much about um, practitioner welfare and, and compassion for the practitioner as well, but I think you, you got us to think about that when you talked about the practice, you know, dividing up, deciding who's going to do what within the care of this family. But I wonder if you wanted to say anything about you know, how we look after each other as professionals and how we look after ourselves when this kind of just, you know, it's just dreadful. It's dreadful as a practitioner. It's dreadful as a human being. It's dreadful because you're a parent yourself and you think about if this was your kid, it's just so difficult. What, what, how, how do we cope? We need more people in the community like Chris, I think, who are prepared to stay, stand up and say that we can't prevent suicide. I, um, whenever I teach, I, I teach with a, a very senior psychiatrist and one of the big things that he does in those workshops is, is to move away that myth. We don't have the same sense of guilt if um, a marathon runner who's thin and fit and has a great diet has a heart attack. We don't feel that we should have known and we should have prevented and we should have done things and we should have, you know, come in ahead of that, of that um, terrible outcome. But Somehow we have this, uh, I think Chris put it as, a, as like an omen feeling that we should have somehow divined that we, we knew and we, we could have been there in that moment and prevented suicide. And that guilt and shame is, is truly awful. And I think we need a peer group around us to be able to support that. Um, mental health is only one of a, a huge number of things that we do. We, we worry about missing meningitis. We worry about missing you know bad outcomes in pregnancy we worry about missing cancer there are a gazillion things that gps worry about every day and so it's, it's understandable that they think that maybe if they've had just that little bit of knowledge or that little bit of skill or that little bit of capacity that they could have come in ahead i think it's important for us as clinicians to um, have support networks around and to be giving that message particularly to young doctors that there are some things that aren't preventable. One in five of us will lose a patient to suicide during our career. And I think the more that we say that and the more that we come across that some of those may not be preventable by us, uh, the less um, inappropriate guilt and shame will be spread around and the less damage will be done. Thanks, Louise. We are, believe it or not, just approaching the final few minutes um, of our webinar tonight. And so I'm going to ask each of our panellists to um, give us a final message. Chris, I'm going to invite you first. And I just wanted to comment, I found that really valuable what you said before about actually helping people with their problems, treating their mental illness, and Louise's comments about you know helping them have the things that they need to have a, a, a meaningful life and to have well-being. So I think that was that was really helpful about actually this isn't just about preventing suicide. This is actually about assisting people with their problems and treating illness. Um, I just wondered whether there was a kind of final message that you wanted to add or to clarify or how you how you'd like what you'd like to leave us with this evening. Look, I, I think I just really finished by saying. With respect to suicide and with respect to the problems that lead to suicide, 
the approach to that is the approach to good medicine. So it's, it's taking a good history, it's being interested in the person, it's finding out about them. I realise, by the way, that GPs only have so much time. I, I mean, it's amazing what GPs do in the time they have available. I'm a psychiatrist, it takes me 15 minutes to say hello. So I'm not being unrealistic about this, but the more, time, the more you can understand the patient, where they're coming from, what their resources are, and how you can harness those resources to help them and how you can treat any identifiable psychiatric or other problems that they've got, the more you'll be able to help that person, like doctors do, and it turns out you'll probably prevent some suicides as well. So that'd be great. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's very clear that far from saying, look, don't bother having the conversation at all because you can't predict anything. It's actually the opposite. It's really about, it frees you up to have this meaningful conversation with a person and to really help get to the bottom of things and help, you know, engage their supports and do what you can. So it's, it's really the opposite almost. It's actually a very real, rich level of engagement with people. Yeah, um, it's completely the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rebecca... What would you like to um, to leave us with tonight? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, Mary, um, what you actually just said, which is that we all do the very best we can. Um, we we use our skills and our training. Uh, you know, whether you want to use a risk assessment tool, that's just one tool that you have. Then you've got your your um, interview. You want to use you know, your observation, you want to be talking to other people, you want to get all the information you have and then make the best clinical judgment that you have and act on it. And in the end, that's what you've been able to do. And that's, that's you know, what you hope will work for your client. It doesn't always work, um, but you're doing the best you can. And, uh, and if things don't turn out, then you know, um, you've got to be kind in yourself as well because you've done your, the best you can and that, that's really, as a professional, that's, that's the obligation that you have, the responsibility that you have to your client. Thanks, Rebecca. And Louise, just um, I'll give you a few seconds if there's something else that you would like to leave us with tonight. Thanks, Louise. I just... I just wanted to say thank goodness for multidisciplinary teams. Um, we couldn't do this work without a group of us around the table in the hope that one of us will be in that moment and will catch someone like Aidan or Nathan or any of that family. And um, the more that we're able to share the load with um, th this sort of complexity, um, the better off the community will be. Thanks so much to all of you. It's been really um, very engaging. The time has just passed and um, we've still got 1,600 people online. Thank you all so much for staying with us tonight and I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Make sure you complete the feedback survey before you log out. Um, the tab is there at the top of your screen that will open. You will be issued with a certificate of attendance um, within four weeks and you'll also be sent a link to the online resources. Don't forget that the webinars do go up on the um, MHPN webinar library if you want to refer colleagues or watch it again yourself. If any content in tonight's webinar was distressing, please seek care for yourself by calling um, Beyond Blue is one suggestion or your GP or local mental health service. And of course, you may have trusted colleagues who you feel that, um, that you can make contact with. And um, I really echo Louise's comment about the multidisciplinary team and this is work we all do together. Uh, if you would like to join an MHPN network in your local area, there's the link to find out about the local network so you can join one today. And um, again, the MHPN website has information about all of their activities. And once again, thanks to the GPMHSC for partnership in this webinar and um, inviting MHPN to uh, work together in this way on this incredibly important topic and can I commend to you the resources from GPMHSC. They're very comprehensive, they're really practical, they're really useful and um, they're available to everybody, not just to GPs, they're in the resources there. So please take a look at those.
And once again, uh, thank you to everyone, uh, particularly our panellists tonight, but also to all of our participants wherever you are, including the person in Bulgaria. And thanks for staying with us and for your contributions to the chat box. And I hope that everyone has a great evening. Good night.